Welcome to Castlevania! Tonight we dive into the African elements of the new Castlevania anime, and then we'll discuss the Castlevania games in general. I am your host, Red Spirit Mask, the nerdiest educator you'll ever meet. Not only have I read about cultures you've never heard of, but I've also played games you've never seen before. So this new anime revolves around Richter Belmont, the main character of Rondo of Blood and an important character in Symphony of the Night. The story of Symphony of the Night was basically merged with the story of Castlevania 3 and one of the uh, PlayStation 2 games, if I remember correctly, in the previous anime. So mostly, that leaves Rondo of Blood as the story to adapt for this new anime. And frankly, they didn't really do that. But that's not such a bad thing since a lot of Castlevania games don't exactly have the most in-depth story. Rondo of Blood's story is basically Richter Belmont saves anime girls and then whips Dracula real good. Anyway, one of the main things this anime did incorporate from the game was the time period in which it's set and they did it in a very clever way. Rondo of Blood happens to take place in the same era that the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution takes place in. So, the show writers decide to integrate those historical events into the same story. If you don't know, these two revolutions are among the most important events in human history, but I don't have time to really go into these revolutions in much detail right now. What I do, however, want to say about it is I like the show's juxtaposition of these revolutions because it forces the audience to reflect on the fact that although the French Revolution was an overall benefit to the world and uplifted the peoples of France, it did not help the peoples who were colonized by France. And what I want you all to understand is that although Haiti and later on the countries of Africa got their independence, the reality is that France, even in this present day, continues to exploit their former colonies and continues to contribute to the suffering of black people. Having said all that, I feel more qualified to teach you all about culture rather than politics, so the heart of this video delves into the African spirituality present in Castlevania. Which leads us to Annette. In the game Rondo of Blood, there is a character named Annette, but she's been completely reimagined for the anime. In the game, she was just Richter's girlfriend and a damsel in distress to save. She was very basic. In the anime, though they have hinted at some romantic feelings between Richter and Annette, her character has evolved greatly in the show. Now she is a freedom fighter from San Domingue, or in other words, Haiti. She was born a slave who was owned by a vampiric slave master named Vablanc. Upon discovering that Annette's mother was practicing magic, he murdered her and left Annette without a family. One day she discovered her own magical powers and used them to escape the plantation. During her time on the run, she met Edouard, who helped her to flee and recruited her into the revolution against slavery. Also, within this revolutionary group, she meets a voodoo priestess named Cecile, who teaches Annette about her magic and her ancestry. Annette is said to have descended from two of the Orisha of Yoruba mythology. On her father's side is Ogun, and on her mother's side is Oranmila. The show does give a satisfactory explanation of the Orisha, but it's a very brief one. Therefore, the goal of my video is to give you a more detailed explanation. So defining what an Orisha is, is not always easy, because I've seen them defined in multiple ways. The anime calls them gods, and that's fine, but it's more complicated than that. Here's the definition that worldhistory.org gives. Orisha are supernatural entities usually referred to as deities in the Yoruba religion of West Africa, though they are actually emanations or avatars of the supreme being Oludumare. Their number is usually given as 400 plus 1 as a kind of shorthand for without number or innumerable. In the book Embodying the Sacred in Yoruba Art, it introduces the Yoruba religion with the following statement. The Yoruba trace the origin of the world to Olodumare, the supreme divinity, also known as Elaide, the creator of all that exists, and Alase, the source of Ashe, an enabling force that makes things happen. Olodumare rarely acts directly, but exercises authority through a host of primordial spirits or nature forces 
known as Orisha. Some of the Orisha are personified and associated with natural or cultural phenomena. Yamoja personifies water and motherhood, Obatala, creativity, Oranmila, wisdom and clairvoyance, Eshu or Legba, meditation, Odudua, divine kingship, Osanyin, curative medicine, Babaluye, diseases, especially smallpox, Ogun, tools, weapons, and warfare, Orisha Oku, agriculture, Shango, thunderstorms and social justice, Oh yeah, tornadoes, Oshun, fertility and beauty, and so on. Yoruba religion focuses on the veneration of the Orisha because they administer the cosmos on behalf of Olodumare. It is to the Orisha that the shrines are built and sacrifices are offered. Now before we move on, I'd like to point out that another name for Olodumare is Olurun, which is the name that I first learned of him by many years ago. So if you ever hear me say Olurun instead of Olodumare, it's because I'm just more used to that name. Anyway, now that we're done with the intro, let's do some more in-depth descriptions of the Orisha that are relevant to the Castlevania anime. Before we talk about Ogun and Oranmila, I think we should start with Eshu. A.K.A. Alegba. I prefer to call him Eshu, but for this video I'll mostly use the name Alegba. If you pay close attention to what Annette says during her spell casting, at one point she says the name Alegba. This subtle detail is very important because it's showing the audience that Annette must commune with Alegba in order to connect with the other Orisha and utilize their powers. On top of that, he's the only one of the Orisha that is visibly seen in the show. He's that yellow spirit with the wide-brimmed hat. This is the way Haitians often depict him. I personally prefer the original Yoruba version of Eshu, but it makes sense for Alegba to appear this way to Annette. Alegba is the youngest of the Orisha, and known to be a mischievous trickster. Beyond that, he is the custodian of Ashe, which is the vital force in all living and non-living things. And Alegba is the intermediary between Oludumare and all of the Orisha, and between the Orisha and humanity. So basically, Alegba is a messenger for all the forces of the cosmos, including the benevolent and malevolent. Although he combines these opposing forces in his character, because he is an Orisha, he overall tends to benefit humanity. Alrighty, let's now move on to the one you've been waiting for, which is Ogun, the Orisha who gives Annette the power to manipulate both metal and rock. Because of his association with tools, weapons, and warfare, Ogun is venerated all over Yoruba land. He collaborated with Obatala to create the archetypical human image in addition to using his machete to clear the primordial jungle and laying the foundation for Yoruba culture. The popular name, Ogun Lana, Ogun Paves the Way, commemorates this prehistoric event, emphasizing the importance of stone and iron tools in agriculture, hunting, lumbering, building, road making, carving, urban planning, and warfare. The contributions of Ogun are equally significant in the religious sphere, because metalworkers are responsible for the tools with which worshippers construct shrines and prepare sacrificial offerings. Hello, Orisha hold Ogun in high esteem, since any Orisha who does not pay homage to Ogun will use his or her teeth to peel raw yams. Like Alegba, the trickster, he is portrayed in many legends as an ambivalent character, a war addict much given to violence. Yet, he is widely revered as a genius who nurtures, protects, and relentlessly pursues truth, equality, and justice. The principal symbol of Ogun on a typical altar is a collection of cutlasses, scrap iron, or assorted metal tools. Some altars include polished stone axes to reflect the fact that he was first associated with stone implements before the Yoruba acquired the knowledge of iron technology. Since he is the patron deity of all those who use iron in their professions, blacksmiths, hunters, farmers, warriors, carvers, barbers, surgeons, and tattooists, shrines dedicated to him by these professionals usually feature their principal tools, anvils, guns, swords, hoes, adzes, blades, and chisels. Altar accessories include images of hunters and warriors in addition to ceremonial objects. When not in use, the blacksmith's poker may be kept on an altar dedicated to the deity. 
Our next Orisha is Oron Mila, also known as Orula and Ifa. This divine figure plays a prominent role in the Yoruba religion because he is a confidant of Oludumare and the only Orisha present at creation. As the originator of the Ifa divination system, he is thought to have the clairvoyance with which to detect the cause of any event in the past, present, and future. Oron Mila had once lived on Earth and aided mankind with his infinite wisdom, but as a result of an offense committed by one of his sons, the old god left the world of men and returned to the realm of the gods. Disorder and despair spread across the Earth. Finally, the children of Oron Mila journeyed to heaven and found their father sitting in the top of a palm tree. He refused their petitions to return with them or even to come down from his lofty perch, but he did give them 16 palm nuts, Ikin of Ifa, with which they might communicate with him and thereby bring a measure of order and happiness into their lives. Thus, the practice of divination is considered an integral part of Yoruba culture, which requires an individual to undergo years of training in order to do properly. So far in the Castlevania anime, unless I miss something, I don't think Annette has shown herself using any of Oron Mila's divination powers, but perhaps the writers are saving that for the next season. Now some of you may be wondering why these Yoruba Orisha that come from Nigeria were applied to a character like Annette who comes from Haiti. Well that's because the Yoruba faith spread far and wide, it spread to other parts of Africa and other parts of the world, so that the Yoruba pantheon can be found in many parts of the Americas and the Caribbean. And it's also worth pointing out that traditions and customs from other parts of Africa are also mixed in these diaspora religions. Now before we move on, let's linger a bit in Haiti and discuss those symbols that Annette's mother had drawn in her home. These symbols are known as Veve, and they are the signature of the Haitian Lao, who are spirits that are comparable to, and sometimes directly derived, from the Yoruba Orisha we talked about earlier. The other foundational cultures of the Voodoo religion include the Fon, Yu, Ipo, and Congo peoples. On top of all that, a layer of Catholicism was added in order to veil it, because enslaved Africans were not allowed to practice their religions. Which is of course why Annette's mother was killed for drawing those Veve symbols. When a Veve is created, it is drawn with cornmeal, flour, or gunpowder and concentrates energies of a particular spirit so that he or she might be inclined to reveal himself or herself by materializing in the body of one of the devotees. The first Veve we see in the anime is Agwe Arroyo, which represents the depths of the ocean where perhaps millions perished in the transatlantic passage, and it's within the ocean depths that voodoo worshippers believe the souls of the dead live. This home for the dead is an island under the sea known as Zillet, where Agwe's palace can be found. Not only is Agwe king of the oceans, but also Lao of direction helps sailors find their bearings when lost at sea, and he provides inspiration and guidance whenever an individual needs them in times of turmoil, loss, or indecision. His female equivalent is the water deity Lassaren. The Aruba equivalents are Olukun and Yamoja. The second Veve etching is Azaka, who goes by a number of other names such as Papa Zaka, Cousin Zaka, and simply Zaka. He is the Lao of agriculture and is seen as a gentle peasant, but greatly respected since he is a very fastidious laborer. Zaka is, to many, considered an extended family member and a Lao of hard work. He is the reminder of the family who came before and the land from which this family came. Both he and his female counterpart Kozin model the relations of the common husband and wife of a farming class family. While Zaka depicts the everyday farmer in his denim and straw hat, Kozin models the average market woman with her loud voice and smart bargaining skills. Both Lao represent the attitude, speech, costumes, and will of the people. The third Veve we encounter is Erzuli Dantor, who represents motherly love. 
She is a very powerful spirit who is both feared and honored. Her power is a source of strength and identity for Haitian women. She is poor and has no use for jewelry. Erzuli Dantor is said to love women and have a special interest in helping them. Also, some say she is a lesbian. What? It's not a joke? I got that from an academic source, I swear. The last two Veve in the anime represent Legba and Ogun, who we've already discussed. So now let's move on to the last African god in Castlevania. This time it's an Egyptian one by the name of Sekhmet. Sekhmet, a Leonine goddess whose name means the powerful one, was worshipped whenever a wadi opened out at the edge of a desert. For in ancient Egypt, those were the places where lions might be found, having come down from the desert to drink at water holes on the edge of the cultivation, and to prey on cattle, and sometimes on men. A late tradition held that the worship of Sekhmet was introduced into Egypt from the Sudan, where lions were more numerous. Her chief sanctuary, however, was at Memphis, where she was considered to be the wife of Ptah and the mother of Nefertem, thus taking her place in the triad of Memphis. Sekhmet, who was usually depicted as a woman with the head of a lioness, was believed to be a manifestation of the enraged Eye of Ra, who devoured the enemies of the Sun God. This fierce goddess was mistress of war and strife. She helped the king to slaughter his enemies against whom he was sometimes said to rage like Sekhmet. Paradoxically, she was also mistress of healing, who drove away sickness. A bloodthirsty goddess who could kill could also cure, just as this lady of the messengers of death could visit them upon Egypt in the form of epidemics so she could be persuaded to remove them through the performance of the rite of appeasing Sekhmet. The title priest of Sekhmet came to mean doctor, possibly because her priests were entrusted with the task of driving out evil spirits that ancient Egyptians thought were the causes of sickness. And who better to fight demons than the goddess of war? By the way, the book I just read from only cost me a dollar and fifty cents. Now that's a good deal. Believe it or not, we're not done talking about gods because this show technically references two other deities that originate outside of Africa. And despite my channel mostly focusing on Africa, I felt I should acknowledge them anyway. In the first episode, Richter comes face to face with a vampire named Olrox, who can transform into a giant serpent. This serpent form is inspired by the Mesoamerican god named Quetzalcoatl. The final god that's referenced in the show is the god of Abraham that is worshipped by the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim peoples. In fact, Christianity is referenced in every Castlevania game due to vampires being weak to the classic items such as crucifixes and holy water which are commonly equipped by the Belmont clan as weapons against the undead. And speaking of games, I did mention at the start of the show that we'd talk about the series in general, so let's get into that now. So due to the game series being dormant for a long while now, I suspect that many viewers of the new animes might not have ever played a Castlevania game. Therefore, I figure it'd be a good idea to give you some game recommendations. The game you should start with is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Yes, despite the two animes being adaptations of Castlevania 3 and Castlevania Rondo of Blood, I don't think you should start with those because those games will likely be too difficult for the average gamer. Though if you can deal with old school game difficulty, then you might as well start with Castlevania 1. And if you want to go with a game whose difficulty is somewhere in between, hard and easy, then you can try Super Castlevania 4, which is basically a reimagining of the first game. But again, most of you should begin with Symphony of the Night. Then, if you like that game, try some of the other great titles like the ones on GBA and DS. More specifically, Aria of Sorrow, and then after that, play Dawn of Sorrow. After you've played these, then go back and try some of the more old school games like Castlevania 1 and Super Castlevania, as well as Rondo of Blood. After all that, feel free to try whatever Castlevania game suits your fancy, whether that be Castlevania 64 Whale Vaginas or Simon's Quest for Snake Titties. 
What? There's a lot of monster girls in Castlevania games. Yeah, okay, there might not be any San Diegos, but the Snitties are real. Anyway, if you find yourself enjoying the Castlevania series, you may also like Super Metroid, because it's half the reason there's a genre called Metroidvania games in the first place. Another title you may like is Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which is a game made by Koji Igarashi, who was one of the star talents behind the creation of numerous Castlevania games. Lastly, two indie games I'll recommend are Shantae and the Pirate's Curse and Dundara. They're both quite a bit different, but they're in the same Metroidvania genre. Shantae is a Middle Eastern inspired game, and Dundara is a Brazilian inspired game. Both are really fun, give them a go. Shantae Dante is more on the easy side of the spectrum, whereas Dundara is a more difficult game. And yes, Dundara was in fact one of the games I featured in the collage art at the start of the video. Comment down below if you recognize some of those games, I'd be curious to see if some of you know them. Same for the African Cultural Collage, if you know their names, type them in the comments. Alrighty folks, thanks for watching and please check out some of our other video game themed videos, which are also educational.